a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Titus, let no man despise thee. Amen. Our blessed hope. Master, we thank you. Thank you for the price that you paid. Thank you, Lord, for the blood that you shed, that sinless sacrifice that we could not have done. We thank you, God, for doing it for us. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us a place in, uh, in, in paradise that we're going to be able to enjoy. And I pray, Lord, that our hearts will ever yearn to be in your presence. Touch us tonight as we study the word of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you, and you may be seated. Praise God. Anybody excited about going to heaven? I sure don't want to go to the other place. It's going to be nice that tomorrow the temperature should drop down just a little bit. Uh, if anybody's out there hot tonight, uh, I don't see Sister Celine here. She would appreciate the fact that it's as warm as it is. But, but uh, if there's anybody hot tonight, I promise you, I did turn on the air conditioning early enough. It's just the fact it's doing all it can do to keep up with this heat that is out there. And uh, so... We just have to accept it and thank God that it's a lot cooler than it could be if we were under the shade tree outside. Amen. Praise God. But we got a lot to look forward to. There's more to this world than just this life that we're living. If we did not, if the resurrection of Jesus Christ had not taken place, the Bible said we would, of all men, be most miserable. But thank God that this is not all there is. This is just the temporary, just, just the transitional state until we get shed out of this tabernacle and get to be a part of that heavenly tabernacle that is up there. Amen. So we are looking for that blessed hope. Um, what we're going to start into tonight in verse 13 is actually the second part of a very long uh, sentence. They, they told me in English to watch out for run-on sentences that never had a period at the end. But this particular sentence lasts four verses long. And so I broke it uh, last time we were having Bible study. And we're picking up actually the second part of that very long sentence. It began talking about the grace of God is actually where it started talking about. And of course, everything that grace teaches us is to prepare us for that blessed hope. That's what, that's what it's all about, is he is getting us ready for heaven. And, uh, and so that's, that's what the message is about. Now, the word looking literally uh, means to expect or to anticipate, but it's, it's a longing for. I hope that our looking is not a fearful looking. I know that when I was a kid and uh, wasn't right with God, knew that I had not been baptized, knew that I had not received the Holy Ghost, knew that if the rapture took place, I would not make it. Anybody remember those feelings? Miserable feelings. I, I was so disturbed about it, but yet I was immature. I was a kid. And... Uh, and so anything that I looked forward to as far as the rapture was concerned was with fear and not with an excitement. But the longer I've lived for God, folks, I really am looking for the day that he comes back. And uh, I'm, I'm longing for it. I'm longing for his presence. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. I've already sent more treasures up there than I have down here on this earth. I have nothing on this earth to hold me down. But the rapture takes place. I hope everything dear to me gets to go with me. Amen. Amen. So there should be a longing for the presence of God to be in his presence. Not a fear of it, but a longing for it. Now, when, when we look at 
the biblical concept of hope. Uh, that word hope, and of course we could go back and I could do a lot of things on the concept of hope, but the Bible said, 1 Corinthians 13, now by the faith, hope, and charity. And so there's a lot of things that we have that we can hope for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. We could talk a lot of things about hope, but um, and so it fits many, many different things. But when we talk about that blessed hope, we're talking about something else. Now, the concept of hope is an earnest expectation. Earnest expectation. Um, let, let, me, let me break that down for just a little bit. Um, I didn't bring my wallet to church tonight. Not much reason to bring it right now, but anyway. If, if, if I was buying a car from you, Lord, help me that I ever should because I've seen you're driving. But anyway, no, I'm kidding. If I was going to buy that Wrangler or whatever that yellow thing is you drive, and you agreed to sell it to me for 100 bucks, hypothetical, okay? Now, I didn't have the whole $100 right now, but I give him $50 earnest money. What, what, what does that mean? That means I am proving that I am going to keep my word. That if I don't keep my word, I lose my earnest money. I have an expectation, a right expectation, that when I walk away, he's not going to sell it to the next guy and pocket my money because I know him better than that. All right, but that is earnest. When we talk about the earnest expectation, we have a concrete right because God never breaks his word. I said God never breaks his word. We have, an, we have a right to expect what he said he would do. It is a earnest expectation. It is also cause and effect. And I don't have time to go back and teach that entire lesson. But when we talk about hope, we're talking about something that we have done. And as a result of our action, we can expect a certain reaction. Because of the cause, we can expect a certain effect. Mm -hmm. This is how... This is how it works, saints of God. It, it's faith that makes you do it in the first place. But once you have done it, you have the right to anticipate the benefit that comes from it. This is how godly principles work. You sow in faith and you have an earnest expectation that God is going to let you reap what you have sown. When we go to talking about heaven, when we go talking about that ultimate form of hope, it is the fact that one of these days we are going to be in the presence of God. We have an earnest expectation by the evidence of receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And you know surely within your own soul that if you have yielded yourself to God and you speak with unknown tongues that you know this is not a man thing it's a God thing I have yielded myself to you public service announcement PSA in the month of October we are going to have a young evangelist come He's the son of a dear friend of mine that passed away since I've been here. His name is his name is same as his dad. Uh, his name is Bert Ray. Bert Ray's going to come. One of the things that he has has been blessed with is the ability to pray people through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I believe between now and then we're going to have people sitting on the pew, ready for that to happen, and we're going to see miracles take place uh, if the Lord waits that long now so 
uh, ultimately, we're going to be in the presence of the Lord. Heaven is going to be our home. What greater joy could we ever have than being in that place? No more pain, no more anxiety, no more work, no, no, more, no more pressures of this world, nothing like that. But we are going to have the greatest life that we could ever have, and that is eternal life and to be with Him. And all the things that roll out of my mind tonight, I've just got to stay in tr- on track But Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27 says it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. When we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, we are actually receiving what? Christ inside of us. It is not a second person in the Trinity and a third person in the Trinity, but thank God it is the fullness of the Godhead that dwells bodily inside of him. Jesus said, I will send the comfort of you, and then he said, I will come to you. He was not talking about two individuals. It's not a duality of personalities. It is literally the one almighty God that dwells inside of us. And because he's inside of us, we have that expectation, the hope of glory. Now, what that hope will do is it will cause you to prepare yourself. If if you have a hope of something, you're going to get ready for it. Uh, I'm getting tired of the heat, kind of wishing I could be on a cool uh, river bank or lake somewhere with a fishing rod in my hands. You know, well, the last times I was doing that, Brother Reno, I was watching a rabbit play around the area, and it was just kind of, you know, just just relax. Now, if I'm going to do that, I better get my fishing pole ready, my gear ready, my stuff ready because you don't wait to the last moment when you, if you're going to wait to the last moment you're going to miss the boat we don't want to be the five foolish virgins we want to be those that have the oil in our lamps we want to have sufficient inside of us we want to prepare for that event john 3 first john 3 and 3 every man that hath this hope purifieth himself even as he is pure and so we know if we're going to get to heaven we've got to clean ourselves we've got to prepare ourselves he's not coming after a bride that is that is has let the wedding garment get filthy he's coming after a bride and that wedding garment has got to be spotless without spot or wrinkle we've got to have everything in order dear saint of god in order to be in that number and so we better get ready and in doing so we will purify ourselves holiness is not a hardship to an apostolic believer holiness is not a difficulty for somebody that's longing for his presence oh somebody help me praise god praise god I got things I'd like to tell you, but I can't tell you. I I can't reveal some confidences. But there's a situation where there's a marriage supposed to take place, and the bride was not willing to do what the groom wanted, and she gets mad at the groom because he says no. She said, I don't have to obey you until I get married to you. Which one do you think was right, the bride or the bridegroom? Does the bridegroom have a right to expect that before the wedding, the bride makes his expectations? Anybody feel differently? I want to tell you something. God has every right to expect that his bride is going to get ready for that rapture in that day. Somebody say amen. And then he talked about the glorious appearing, not just the appearing. Somebody said glorious. The glorious appearing of our God, not just God, our great God, and not just Jesus Christ, but our Savior, Jesus Christ. Watch the adjectives here. Watch the descriptive language that is used here. It is going to be a glorious event. 
That day is when the disciples watched Jesus go up into the clouds. They sat there with astonishment on their lips. They sat there probably with their mouth open just watching until the angel finally showed up and said, what, what, why are you staring up into the heavens? This same Jesus is going to come again in like manner. It's going to be a glorious event, just as shocking and startling as it must have been to those, those disciples to watch him ascend into heaven. Can you imagine what it's going to feel like when we see him on that day? And we who are alive and remain get to feel what he felt on that day and we get to rise with him. I'm looking forward to it, saint of God. It is going to be a glorious appearing. Amen, amen. Now let's let the scripture speak for itself here tonight. Revelations chapter 1 and verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all of the kingdom, kindred of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen, even so, so be it. Let it be, God. Because even though this world that crucified him and is willing to crucify him all the time, even though they reject him, there's going to come a day when he's going to show up in those clouds. And it's going to be fear to some, but it's going to be the joy to somebody else. Matthew 24 and verse 30. Anybody want to shout yet? Then shall, they sh uh, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and with great Glory! I'm telling you, it's going to be a glorious appearance uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a day. 1 Thessalonians. Now, I could read a lot of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in this, but I've got to isolate it down. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. It's going to be worth it all, saint of God. He finished up the next verse and said, Comfort one another with these words. This ought to be the thing that just makes you feel like it doesn't matter what you face, it's going to be okay. It doesn't matter what kind of stuff we deal with. What we have looking forward to is so good. Saint of God, there's a payday someday. There's a payday someday. Let, remind, let me remind you how sin operates. Sin operates the same way that debt operates. You get the use of it first. And then you pay for it later. And you end up paying a whole lot more than what you could have if you paid up front. Now, God doesn't work on a debt principle. He works on the opposite. You pay up front. You pay for it now. And then you get to enjoy it forever. And it's cheaper. Saint of God, this world... And all that it has, whatever you have to give up, it's nothing in comparison to what you get to have when we get to heaven. Somebody shout amen. Job said it like this, for I know that my Redeemer liveth. And he shall say, stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though the skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see the Lord. I shall see the Lord. I'm telling you, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we shall be like him. Corruptible is going to take on incorruption. Mortal is going to take immortality on. Oh, saint of God, I don't know what this body is going to be like. We sow to the natural and we reap to the spiritual. I'm telling you, 
I read it again in Corinthians this week. I think it was today or yesterday. I read it again. You put a piece of corn in the ground, whether it's corn, whether it's wheat, whether it's green beans, when it comes out of the ground, it doesn't look like what it went in with. Now, it's going to produce, but it's not going to look like what you gave up. Mm. Grady, Grady Nutt said it like this in one of his comedy things. He, he was talking about a funeral, and the preacher was trying to explain to him that this that body, you know, it was just a shell. And the only thing he could think of to compare it to was, was, a, was a nut. And he said, we know, the, we, we know the, the individual's gone, just the nuts left. Well, we, we put into the ground this old man. But what's going to come out of the ground is not going to resemble. Do we, what, what about, what about, and this, they've asked this, Brother, Brother Bernard put out something recently on it. What about cremation? What about cremation? Let me tell you something, friend. What if you die and you get lost in the ocean? All the fishes of the ocean eat you up and the sharks chew you to bits and you're just scattered all the way through the, the, the Pacific Ocean. What's going to happen to you on the rapture? The same God that takes one out of a grave is going to pull him out of the ocean. Abraham said, even though I burn him, God is able to resurrect him back up and give him back to me. It matters not what you do to this body. Dust to dust and ashes to ashes. But I'm going to tell you what is going to happen. One of these days, he's going to call us up. And when he does, it's not going to be what we were. It's what we're going to be in him. Hallelujah. What a day. What a glorious day that's going to be. I'm looking forward to the rapture of the church. It's what you live for. Don't you fear death. Don't you fear what somebody can do to you. Don't fear what they say about you. Don't fear about what happens to you. Because what you've got in front of you is so much better than whatever's left down here behind. So just look forward to the Lord's coming uh, and uh, in whatever way it happens. Just rejoice. Because the Lord is coming back. Amen, amen. Then the next verse said, he gave himself for us. And I could take some time, but he said, I lay down my life. No man takes it from me. He did it willingly for us. He gave himself for us that he would redeem us from all iniquity. Scripture says As the wages of sin is death. That's, that's the bottom line. Because sin entered into the world, death entered into the world. All the way back into to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17. He told him, said, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, don't eat of it. Because the day that you eat thereof, you're going to surely die. Satan questioned it. Satan sowed the seeds of doubt. And because of that, the temptation, uh, mankind fell. It really wasn't, it wasn't Eve's issue. Eve was tempted. Eve did it. But it was resting upon the man because he participated in it. The responsibility lays on us men on so many areas, so many things. Men, be men. Be men. Lead with godly lives. But that's where sin came in. Now, sin's penalty is death. And death, it had sin had to be paid for. By a sinless life. All sin is purged by blood. And the only way for that to be effective is for it to be a sinless life. And you know as well as I know that there's no man among us that is absolutely sinless and perfect. Let him that is without sin cast the first stone. We can't do that to one another because we've done things just as bad and maybe worse. But oh, thank God for the mercy of the Lord. Thank God that he's willing to look at us just like he looked to the woman 
and said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Because he was going to pay the price. The Bible said, you're going to call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus told his disciples, said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And then he went on and told them, and he said, you are my friends if you keep my commandments. Amen, amen. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, for as much as you know not that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, from your vain conversations received the traditions uh, by the tradition of your father, but by the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Thank God. Just like Abraham was told when he sat, was going to sacrifice Isaac, he told Isaac, God will pro- pro- provide himself a lamb. And the lamb was caught in the bushes. And, uh, and what tremendous preaching we've heard on that in the past. But just as much as that took place, when humanity had no other option, Jesus Christ came in the flesh. God manifest in the flesh and he paid the sacrifice that we could not pay we could not do it now the bible also said that it was he was going to deliver us from all iniquity this word is powerful enough that i need to stop for just a moment and i need to analyze it with you lay down the concept There are three words that we use interchangeably um, in many occasions. That is number one, sin, number two, transgressions, and number three, iniquity. They all have a slight different meaning. But the word iniquity to you and I as children of God is a very, very fearful thing. Very fearful. David asked God. He said, search me and know me, O Lord. See if there be any wicked way in me. Psalm 51. He's pleading with God to, to, to remove the iniquity out from him. So what does the word iniquity mean? The word iniquity means lawlessness. Lawlessness. Say that with me. It means literally that you're not going to be forced into doing anything you don't want to do. If you have that kind of an attitude, you are bound in iniquity. I'll let that set in. Because if we get that spirit, you're not going to tell me what to do. That rebellious spirit is the sin of iniquity. Scripture said rebellion is as iniquity. Stubbornness is a sin of witchcraft. We've got to watch out for these things. Now here is what iniquity is. It is the twisting of the laws of God to justify oneself, thus making us a law unto ourselves. Satan in heaven lied To his own self. And said I can do such and such. That's what the spirit of iniquity is. It's when you decide it doesn't apply to me. I don't have to do what you've told me to do. It doesn't fit in my situation. I don't think that's what it means. I think it means this over here. Hello somebody. And it's especially fearful. I've already said that. Because a spirit of self-justification will keep us out of heaven. You do understand that, don't you? There came the time, the parting of the sheep from the goats. And there he talked about when that group came before him and they pleaded, but, but we've done many mighty works in your hands. And, and, and so what did he say? Depart from me, 
ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Some of the most fearful words I think a person could ever hear is God said, I know you, 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 you did things on my name, but I didn't know. I didn't have that relationship with you that I longed to have with you because you never accepted my will in your life. Somebody say amen. amen. Fearful thing. Fearful thing. Now, I've got to move on. He said he's going to do it to purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now, this word peculiar, uh, when I was a kid, resonated in my spirit. And I found out later it didn't mean what I thought it meant. I thought the word peculiar meant you was a little strange. Anybody else have that idea of it? The word peculiar does not mean odd or strange. It means that you are highly unusual and you are desirable. You are special. And I don't mean the special as in the short yellow bus. Okay? I mean special in the way that you're so unique there's not many like you. Do you know why gold is valuable? Because you don't find it everywhere, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And saying of God, if we, if if the church was in the popular majority, it wouldn't be so special. There's got to be somebody that stands out from the rest of this world. Somebody say Amen. A couple of verses here. Let's go back to the book of Exodus, chapter. Uh, 19 verses 5 and 6 now therefore if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my commandment that little word if gets you in trouble every time because you're not going to get this without a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ you're not going to get it unless you keep your word and your part of the bargain if you will obey my voice keep my commandments then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine verse 6 and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests a holy nation these are the words that thou shalt speak to the children of Israel it's telling Moses this now let's take that into the New Testament 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 but ye are a chosen generation. I love this verse. A royal priesthood and holy nation. Anybody want to know where he got it from? He got it from the book of Exodus. A peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Do you feel like it's a marvelous light? Do you feel like it's a great revelation that God has given to us that we are privileged to be a part of. I said privileged to be a part of. So thankful that we get this op opportunity when there were so many others that he could have called, but he saw something in us. Amen, amen, amen. Now verse 15 is going to be a summation of what Paul has told Titus throughout this chapter. He's been instructing him. Some people say that Titus chapter 2 is some of the con most condensed, concise information of instruction to a young minister that is inside of the Bible. Speakingly to a young minister. Of course, I hope that I have laid the foundation that the reason a minister has to do it is because it's also what God expects for everybody else. So he says, these are the things that I want you to do. I want you to speak, I want you to exhort, and I want you to rebuke with all authority. So we're looking at here three avenues of apostolic ministry. Three avenues that God wants them to do with. I could also say the same thing over there in Titus where he, where he gives Paul, or T Timothy rather, where he gives Timothy some some instructions, and I could break it out into four, but let me just talk about these that are in front of us 
in this particular verse. Number one, he said to speak. I know that our lives speak louder than our words. Right? But we still have an obligation to open our mouth and speak. And when that's done, it needs to be done with authority, confidence, assurance, not because we're in charge, but because we're under submission to authority. And so we are speaking not from our own place, but we are speaking in his place. Um, I could say a lot about that. But the word, the word to speak means to talk. It means to teach. It means to preach. It means to do those things. What we're doing tonight. What we do on Sunday when, it, when all of that transpires and happens. You need the word of the Lord. And it's the obligation of the pulpit to do that and to instruct it. Of course, you don't have to have a pulpit to do it. You can do it at a dinner table just as well. Right? The next thing he said is to exhort. The word exhort literally means to call them to come near. I think it's very interesting because he is, he is literally saying, come here, let me, let me gather you around. Let me, let me, let me, and you're calling them to a place that, that you're doing it. I see that as the altar call, the persuasive side of it, the call to action. The call to a commitment that God wants you to do something. Hear me, saints of God, because I, I want you to know this, and I want you to know it well. One of the reasons, now I don't do it every time on a Wednesday night. Sometimes the Spirit of the Lord gets to move, and we're going to react with prayer. But teaching is more for you to go home and think about. And one of the things you do to cheat yourself is to walk out of these doors and immediately forget what just happened in service. You need to mull over it. You need to feed off of it for the next few days. It needs to get down into your spirit. Review it. Dwell on it. But when preaching takes place, you need to respond because it is a call to action. And you need to respond to what God does. I, I, I dread it if people just sit there. It bothers me. On Sunday morning, I want it to change, but all I can do is keep laying it out there. When we have those that just sit back in the back, sit there and look around, and you know like I know they're the ones that need it the most. So if you're just sitting there after I finish preaching, you know that's who I'm talking to. I'm talking to you. I'm thinking to myself, they really should have been up here. I do not understand it when saints of God do not respond. I understand it when sinners do, don't, because they haven't quite got it yet. They're, they're, not, they're not in it. But saints of God, you need to move at the moving of the word. You need to do what you can. You need to allow yourself to be brought near and, and those things. So exhorting is to bring us into that place of unity. And then there's that word that is no fun, and I don't like it because I don't like confrontation. But there's that word rebuke. Now, the word rebuke, I think you can rebuke with kindness, and it doesn't have to be done with a mean spirit. Does anybody else agree with me on that? Uh, if, if I speak right and you respect me and appreciate me, then I don't have to get upset. And All right, let me, let me explain it to you like this. I've raised boys. I know your little girls were perfect angels, and they always did exactly what you asked them to do. It must have been the sweetest thing to raise four girls in the Garcia family, because obviously they never faced anything like this. But as, as a dad, I would often say, you know, we ought, we ought to do such and such. Son, why don't you go to your room and, and get such and such. And because of my language is more suggestion than it is demand, they sit there and keep doing what they're doing. Hello, somebody. 
they don't come in yet because, you know, you've just set dinners on the table and they keep, they keep doing what they're doing. It's like it's not all that important to them until you finally have had enough. And what do you do? Don't, do me, don't give me this number one. Let me kill. You know what you do. They don't respond until you raise your voice. Do you get your daddy voice on? I hate to do that. I don't like to do it. I didn't like to do it to the kids, and I don't like to do it to my congregation. I will if I have to. I can do it. I'm just not very pretty when I do it. I'm needing some response, folks. Kind of some agreeance, you know, like, Pastor, that's good with me. <laughs> you don't have to put me on spot like that. Because I don't want to do that kind of stuff. Don't like to operate like that. But unfortunately, there's some people that do not think things reasonably and logically. And they have to have, because of their mental skill set, they have to have that angry voice of authority to make them respond. And you just t decide for yourself where you want to be. <laughs> you just decide whether you're going to be one of those kids that are going to play around until you're forced into it, or whether you're going to, my sheep hear my voice. I, I'd rather be one of those that, that just simply because David said, I wish I had a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem. That there was that response that was to it. That, that is a much better thing. But rebuke literally means to correct, to admonish, to reprove. And that's essential as well. Because if we don't have some correction, we will oftentimes continue in the behavior that we are doing. We'll, we'll follow the things of this world. And we should not do it, saints of God. Should not do it. Now down to the last phrase of what we're going to discuss today. Paul told Titus, he said, let no man despise you. Don't let anybody despise you. Now he said almost the exact same thing to Titus or to Timothy when he spoke to Timothy. Apparently Timothy was younger than Titus. I can derive that from this because he doesn't say to Titus, anything about his youth. He does to Timothy. He said, don't let them despise you for your youth. Now, there's two things that this means. Number one is, Timothy, don't give them any reason to despise you. Don't, don't go acting like a fool that people will look down on you. But that, that is the more derived thing. The more direct implication of this is he is saying don't let anybody find you contemptible there is a certain responsibility of honor and respect to the office that that uh, that a minister carries out and and I, I've said this to you of recent I don't want to lord anything I don't want to be that kind of thing I, I, I hesitate. The older I get, especially, it's, 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 I, I, I know my own humanity, okay? I know that I'm nothing special. Moses, the Bible said, was the meekest man in the earth. And some of them took advantage of that and said, Moses, who do you think you are? You're no better than we are. We can do exactly what you're doing. And please understand, I am well aware that people could do what I'm doing and maybe do it better. I'm well aware of that. But that does not change the position that God calls a man into. You, you, you understand that? So when, when Paul speaks to Titus and to Timothy and says, don't let them despise you, He's literally saying, don't let them find you contemptible. Now, the word literally means here to think beyond. In other words, that's what the Greek word means. It means that they think they're better than you are. It's not about a competition. 
It's about a calling. Hello? It's about a calling. And so he says, let not man. The word medis, med, medice here literally means none, nothing, plus without delay. So you have the word nothing or none, and then you also have, this is a combination here, without delay. And so he's letting him know you need to respond quickly. You need to act quickly when somebody tries to put you in your place because they think you're better, they're better than you are. Uh, John said this about diatrophies uh, when it came to 2 John. He, he, he was trying to send people in to that city. But diatrophies who desired the preeminence would not let them come. And so even though they were being sent, they were not being accepted. And, uh, and so Paul is saying to these men, you're going to have to respond to some things. Now, I've told you this uh, many times, several times, that I've never enjoyed being publicly put on the spot and rebuked. If anybody likes that, there's a word for it. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't, it's a bad thing psychologically. But nobody likes to be treated like that, really. We, we don't, we don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want to be put on the spot. Uh, I, I remember uh, as a kid, thankfully it's never happened since I've been an adult, but I can remember when I was a kid and dad would call me out of the pew because I was goofing off and make me sit on a folding chair up on the platform while he preached or teach, taught that night. And my face would be red, but at least he got me on the platform, right? So, <laughs> got me used to a platform. But, uh, but, but that was embarrassing. I will promise you this. If something is done in private, I will deal with it in private. I will deal with the correction as public as the mistake was. If it was something that, that wasn't done open and publicly, then I'll do it as gracefully and quietly as, as I can because nobody really needs to know about it. But you let somebody deal with me publicly. And I'm not going to wait two or three services to deal with it. I'm going to do it right then. And hopefully, that will be for your comfort. Do you understand what I'm saying? That pastor won't let somebody take over the service and try to do those kind of things. That there's control and authority that is being taken place uh, in that situation. So, so um, trust me, God loves his people. He loves his sheep, the sheep of his pasture. And he is not going to tolerate some hireling mistreating his sheep. Because if anybody mistreats the sheep, they're not a shepherd, they're a hireling. A, hire, a shep, shepherd loves the sheep. A shepherd, the Bible says, will lay down his life for his sheep. But a hireling will run from the wolves. He'll, he'll avoid, he'll run, keep his own safety instead of theirs. So what I'm saying is this. You don't have to worry about whether the preacher gets out of line. Because if he does, there's a God in heaven that's not going to let anybody abuse his sheep. Anybody believe that? God will take care of his own. And God does watch out for you and love you and uh, cares for you. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Next time we're going to go in chapter 3. We'll start in chapter 3. And, uh, and we've got 15 more verses in chapter 3 to cover. And I hope it's been as interesting to you as it has been to me to study out. Praise God. Let's stand together. Why don't you do this tonight? Just take a moment. Step across the aisle if you have to. 
brother to brother, sister to sister. Why don't you just find somebody and pray for them? Put your arm around them. Pray for them. Pray that God blesses them. Pray that God ministers to them. That God will keep their joy up. That God will keep their strength up. That God will provide everything that they have need of. Would you do that for just a moment? Go to somebody and pray. Praise God. Praise God. God, take care of us as a body. You, have, you know what we need. You know all that there is there. You know the private pain of the heart. You know the agony that we say, face, the things that we quietly suffer under. Minister to one another, Jesus. Strengthen, heal, touch, encourage. I pray in the glorious name of Jesus. Bless the precious saints at Calvary Apostolic Church. Bless them, I pray, in your name. We worship you, Jesus. We glorify you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. It's a privilege to be a child of God. God bless you, and you're dismissed tonight. In Jesus' name.